Hey, today we got a lightning round video, which is uh, where I take questions from Patreon supporters who support at a certain level, that level being $50 a month. Yeah, I know that's insane, but these insane people are what helps keep the channel going. So I wanna make sure that those insane people are happy, or at least happy they made that insane decision. And yeah, that whole get a question answered thing is just one of those perks uh, that you get at that level. Other levels have different perks, like interacting with me in live streams and Zoom calls, uh, exclusive Discord server access. This has now become a shameless Patreon ad. Anyway, in these lightning round videos, I usually get asked at least one question that kind of sends me to a place I wasn't really expecting. And uh, today definitely had one of those. Actually, it has two of those. So I encourage you to stick around to the end because the one at the end does kind of spark a bit of a debate and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. But anyway, let's start up this thing. Brian Beswick asks, the first images from Web are a big deal, but we also heard something big too. What's your thoughts on the new FRB discovered? So Brian sent me this space.com uh, article and somewhere in this sea of ads is an actual article about this weird new uh, FRB that was discovered last month. FRBs, if you don't know what that is, they are fast radio bursts, and they've been kind of a mystery for a while now. Uh, I think the first one was discovered in 2009. They're basically extremely short, like millisecond long, but they release about as much energy in that millisecond as the sun does in three days. And the spooky part, nobody knows what causes them. The most likely candidates are pulsars or magnetars, but it's still not completely settled. Any fart, what's interesting about this one is that instead of the burst happening in milliseconds, this one is three seconds long, so it's literally like thousands of times longer. And it also happens in regular intervals, so they're kind of comparing it to a, a universal heartbeat. So poetic. They named it FRB 2019-1221A, and what's cool about it is that they think that it could help shed some light on what these things are. But even cooler is that the regularity of it could actually be used to help kind of measure the expansion of the universe. By the way, the instrument that detected it is called CHIME, which stands for Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Love me some acronym porn. Fishtail asked, are you planning on ever doing a speaking tour? I was actually just talking to somebody about that the other day. Um, that's something I've been considering for a while, which may be why you're asking this. I'm sure I've mentioned it before. Um, nothing is planned, but plans are being made. You guys tell me if you're interested in that. John Regal asked, have you ever been recognized in public outside of creator-specific venues? If so, would you mind sharing an anecdote about it from your perspective? Okay, so it, it, it doesn't happen a lot but it happens enough that I'm aware that somebody could recognize me in, out in public somewhere. So I always try to be on my best behavior. Not that I generally engage in bad behavior, but yeah. Probably the most recent one that really surprised me was uh, when I was in Galway um, in, in Ireland. Yeah, we were walking around Galway and, and a guy approached me. Um, there were some like sort of street hawkers around, so that's kind of what I thought he was at first. By the way, I think his name was Paul. Did I remember that right? Sorry, dude, if I'm getting your name wrong. But anyway, it was funny because he kind of came up to me and that was my first thought was that he was like gonna try to sell me something. And then he kind of comes out with this like, are you on YouTube? <laughs> and I was kind of, I, I just started laughing. But for anybody who ever bumped into me in public and, and came up and said something to you, I guarantee you I walked away second guessing myself and what I said during our encounter far more than you did. Cause I really, I'm still new to the whole thing and it's still kind of weird to me to kind of be like, would you like a picture? It's like, I'm assuming they want a picture with me. It's like, is that, is, is that snobby? Like assuming something? I just always walk away from them kind of being like, I probably could have handled that better or something, you know? I just really, uh, I'm, I'm still new at that situation. But I will say what's even weirder than that, what's far weirder than that, is when um, somebody sees me in public and they don't come up and say anything to me, but then I get home and I get on Twitter and somebody's like, I saw you at the mall today. And that's what I mean by like, always kind of being aware that somebody out there might recognize me. So it's a little weird like that. I will say whenever I'm out somewhere and I see somebody walking around with like a NASA shirt on or, uh, or, or, or a SpaceX shirt, some kind of nerd shirt on, I'm always kind of like, they might know who I am. But having said that, if for some reason you do happen to walk across me out in, in public somewhere, uh, feel free to come up and say hi. It's, it's always good to meet people who watch the channel because I do this whole thing in a room by myself and it's always good to like put a face to somebody who's actually watching what I do. Fishtail also asked, what do you think about the YouTube thumbnails that are intentionally designed to make you rage watch the video? Uh, I hate them with every fiber of my being. What I hate about them more is that they work. 
What I've raised about personally is this trend of, uh, they call it Elon bait, which is basically just put Elon's face in a thumbnail and say finally happened on there or something and everybody clicks on it. Like it, it, there are all these like scammy channels that do it and now I'm starting to see legit channels, channels that I actually, uh, you know, enjoy quite a bit starting to sort of co-opt it themselves because they're like, well, hell, if that's what you gotta do to get people to watch your videos, I'll do it. But it's an interesting phenomenon because it's, it's not so much that, uh, the, well, the rage thing, you know, making people mad enough to click on it is one thing, but it's another thing that's like, they're intentionally misleading thumbnails and titles. They're titles that are very clearly untrue and it makes you want to click on it just to be like, are they really saying this? The one I'll never forget was one that claimed that Elon built the Egyptian pyramids. I'm not even joking. I saw a thumbnail that claimed that. And I've said this before, I try not to be too clickbaity, but we live on a platform now that where apparently that is encouraged because those videos that have those kinds of thumbnails, I see them in my feed all the time from channels that I don't follow and I don't want to watch, but there they are. YouTube shares those around. I don't think anybody wants this to be a platform where people have to resort to that kind of thing just to get people to watch their videos, but here we are. Robin Tennant Colburn asked, a friend told me that somebody at a local scientific institution told her that birds poop on blue cars more than any other car because that's the color of water and birds tend to drop there and their offsprings poop over water. I started searching the internet for corroboration, but I keep seeing the number one pooped upon car color is red. Is there truth out there? Or is it really maybe just random? Robin always brings me the weirdest questions. <laughs> and uh, I love it. It's, it's cool, it's fun. Um, because weird is fun, so why not? But I also kind of hate it, because they're also usually really hard to answer. So Robin, love ya, but hate ya. So I looked online and uh, yeah, I found an article that referenced this one particular study that says that it's red and um, we might as well talk about this study for a little bit because yeah, like it gets referenced a million times over. So this was done in the UK by an auto parts company called Halfords. And what they did was they looked at over 1100 cars in about five cities and they found that the red cars got the worst at 18%, blue cars at 14%, black cars at 11%, white at 7%, gray or silver got 3% and green only got 1%. Now they don't provide a link to this study. Anywhere that I looked, I could never find a, a link to the original study. So I don't really know what their methodology was. Like, did they count individual droppings or was it just by car? Like did a car with five turds count the same as a car with one turd? Actually, the percentages only add up to 54. So I'm assuming that they looked at 1100 cars and then of the cars that had turds on them, these were the colors that got hit. But I mean, there's still a lot that I don't know about it in terms of like where they chose to look in these things because you know, different socioeconomic areas are gonna have different types of car, some of which are more popular in different colors than other kinds. Like I feel like I wanna have an experiment where they took five cars from different colors and parked them under a balcony or around a tree or something like that and see if one gets consistently hit more than the others. Like this is just one of those things that could be done in a million different ways and come to a million different conclusions it feels like. In fact, the British Trust for Orthonology uh, got a hold of this study and they actually pushed back against it saying, quote, we do know that birds can be attracted to certain colors during display, but droppings on cars is probably more to do with where you park. If you park where birds roost, then you're gonna get a lot more droppings on your vehicle, unquote. So there you go, guys. Scientists have effectively proven that if you park your car where birds poop, you're more likely to get pooped on. Science. But this particular article goes on to say that birds might poop more on red cars because they think that it's food because, uh, you know, red is the color of blood. So they're drawn to red cars and then therefore poop on them more. Another theory is that red is a mating color. So birds might, you know, seek out that color to use that to attract other mates. And then one theory also suggests that uh, cleaner cars actually tend to get pooped on more because the bird sees their reflection in it and it scares them enough to poop. It reads, quote, Females would poop because they thought they saw a male they could mate with, but they defecate out of frustration when they realize they couldn't mate since what they thought was an actual bird was only their reflection. I mean, who hasn't been so frustrated with the dating scene that they physically shit themselves? I don't know. I think this might be one of those things where like, um, you know, they say that red cars get more speeding tickets. So if you buy a red car, you're more likely to get pulled over. And people look for all types of reasons why this happens. Everything from like police or profiling against people who drive red cars or, the, or that the red paint kind of messes with cops, you know, radar guns. 
when in reality, it all just comes down to the fact that um, red is a really popular color for sports cars. And people who drive sports cars tend to drive them faster because, you know, that's what they're made for. Hence more speeding tickets. Like, I imagine this is something like that, just some weird correlation. Uh, like, people who drive red cars, you know, live where there are more pigeons, or they park under trees more, I don't know, something like that. I mean, again, assuming this was even a real legit study, you know, it was done by a company that sells car wash accessories, so, I mean, take from that what you will. And I saw a butt ton of articles that reference this, uh, this study back in 2012. Uh, it looks like it was first reported in the Daily Mail, and the, even they don't have a source link, so I can't find the actual study to save my life. So yeah, if any of you can find it, please feel free to share in the comments. So yeah, I feel like this is one of those things where like somebody did a study and came out with a thing and published it and then it wound up on the internet and it just got passed around and passed around and eventually became common knowledge and it's based on bupkis. But I would love to hear the, the theory about the blue. I didn't find that anywhere. I don't know. Fishtail rhymed, as Zoe chews shoes, whose shoes does she choose? She was never picky. She'd chew anybody's shoes. Thankfully, she doesn't really do that anymore. And then John Regal asked, how many lows could Rob Lowe rob if Rob Lowe could rob lows? Okay, what happened on Patreon this month? And Cole Parker asked, what's the update on Dear Moon? And would you think about applying to go yourself and do a few answers with Joe in orbit around the moon? Well, they closed down submissions a while back, um, and I did think about applying for it, but chose not to. There really hasn't been a lot announced, uh, especially this year, but uh, if you haven't been following it since the very beginning, since the announcement, well, here are some of the broad strokes. It was first announced in 2018. It was the brainchild of Yusako Maezawa, and the original idea was he was gonna invite eight to 12 artists and entrepreneurs to fly around the moon on a SpaceX Starship, and then they can kind of share that experience with the world. Actually, it was originally gonna be on a Crew Dragon in 2018, but it would have required the Falcon Heavy to be able to get up to the moon, and it had not been crew rated yet, uh, and eventually SpaceX decided not to crew rate the Falcon Heavy and just focus on Starship. So he upgraded his plan to Starship and set it for 2023. Now in March of last year, Mezawa announced that he was gonna open up eight seats to the general public and then just encourage people to apply with videos detailing why they wanted to go. Uh, and apparently they got over a million entries from all around the world. They did close down entries uh, later on that year and they haven't really made any announcements other than to say that they've narrowed it down to the finalists uh, and they're doing medical checks and testing qualifications and stuff like that. And it hasn't been publicly announced, but there have been rumors that the crew has been picked. But I don't know who those people are. The only actual name that's been floated around is the filmmaker uh, Damien Chazelle. He shot the movie First Man with Ryan Gosling. It's all about Neil Armstrong, but I guess he did an interview with Mezawa, and Mezawa just asked him if he would like to join. To my knowledge, he has not accepted the offer, um, but they're being super secretive around it, so who knows. Now, asking if I would ever want to do something like that, I mean, Maybe I'm not really an American hero type or something like that, but, but no, I am not gonna be one of the first people online to do something like that. And don't get me wrong, it is an absolute uh, dream of mine to go to space someday, and I really hope that someday space tourism becomes so commonplace that it's like, you know, taking a cruise or something. I would totally be up for something like that, but no, I'm, I'm not gonna be one of the pioneers. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just talk about it on my channel. That's, that's close enough for me. Now, as for timelines and how realistic they are, this is where things do uh, get interesting because, again, it was planned for 2023. Uh, from what I can tell, it's still planned for that, but, um, you know, SpaceX has not gotten into space yet, so uh, consider me super doubtful. Now, something I keep saying ad nauseum is that um, I, I think it's gonna be a while before the Starship is crew rated, especially with the whole propulsive landing thing, and even more so if they're gonna try to actually catch it in the chopsticks. It's just a totally brand new thing that's never been tried before, and there's just so much that you're gonna have to go through before, especially NASA ever agrees to let astronauts go up and land like that. Now, private citizens on private launches, different thing, but again, I'm not gonna be one of the people that's gonna be the first ones to try that. So I think it's gonna get pushed to 2024 at the very earliest, um, but if they are able to pull that off, this is where things do get really interesting because somebody else is planning on going up in 2024 as well that somebody else is NASA with Artemis II. And uh, it's actually gonna have pretty much a similar flight plan to what Dear Moon is planning. So just sit with that for a second. If SpaceX is able to send a dozen artists and poets and dancers around the moon in a fully reusable ship before NASA can send four highly trained astronauts in a single-use ship that costs $2.2 billion, I mean, I don't think we'll ever see SLS fly again. 
But, and this is a big but, this is only if SpaceX can actually deliver the Starship fast enough. Because as of the day this video goes out, assuming everything goes to plan, NASA will be ahead. Their vehicle will have gotten to space. Of course, SpaceX might be right behind them. They're supposed to do their first orbital launch in uh, just a month or two, so yeah. 2024 could get really interesting. But no, I'm super curious to hear what you guys have to say about it in the comments. But yeah, yeah. I guess we'll just wait and see. You know what you don't have to wait for, though? My videos when you're signed up for Nebula, because I release those early over there and ad-free. There are Nebula subscribers that are watching you, people watching this right now, and they're just like, amateurs. So you've heard me talk about Nebula on here a lot, and I know you've heard other creators uh, promoting Nebula as well, and maybe you've been wondering, why, Joe? Why, Joe? I'll tell you why, because I, and a hundred or so creator friends of mine, we actually own Nebula. It is creator-owned. It is a platform we built to have a little space of our own that's not subject to the whims of a faceless algorithm. Because that's the thing about being on YouTube, you know? At any given moment, a bunch of ones and zeros in a black box can decide that, you know, we're only gonna show these kinds of videos to the audience, or, or we're only gonna focus on shorts right now, or suddenly if you say the word butterfly, you'll be demonetized. I'm exaggerating, but not by much. So that's why Nebula exists. It's a place where we can focus on things that we're interested in, that our audiences are interested in, and not the interest of an algorithm. That's actually specifically why I've been uploading videos about forgotten atrocities on there, because I find these stories fascinating, but YouTube probably would throttle or demonetize them. And honestly, it's, it's a really great platform. Like, almost every creator I follow is on there, so it kind of feels like a curated list of my favorite stuff. And now there's Nebula classes, so you can get extra nerdy and, and learn actual skills from your favorite creators. So, you know, it, it's a growing platform. We're still trying new things, and uh, it's only going to get better from here. And I'm sure you know where I'm going to go with this next, but the best way to get Nebula is for free when you sign up with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is pretty much the best streaming service on the planet for documentaries and educational programs in pretty much every category you can imagine, from science to history, art, futurism, technology, cats. Yeah, there's like 50 shows on cats. Anyway, to get both services, just go to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. That'll give you a 26% discount for a grand total of $14.79 for an entire year. For both services. So seriously, I get people asking all the time what's the best way to support this channel. My honest answer is to sign up for this bundle. Uh, not only does it help grow this platform that's so important to us, but you get so much from it. I mean, for the cost of a movie ticket, you can get two streaming services for a whole year. And to help support the channel. So yeah, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. Go check it out if you haven't already. I'll put the link down below. Big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the answer files on Patreon and the members who are uh, just supporting being an awesome community and just being really cool people. I got some new names I need to shout out real quick. I'm actually way behind, so let me run through these. Uh, we got Justin McNair, Henrik Otter Johnson, SC West Everly, uh, Karen Sheets, Craig Goodland, Odd is the Don, <laughs> Uh, Francisco Gomez, Stevie O'Nash, Jeff Milarnik, uh, Lee Bridges, Ian Zayanen, Ted Bruning, Solar Winds, Aurora Borealis, Kristen Scott, Ramon Jaimez, DNA Mobile Gaming, Costly Fiddle, and Roland Arthur Aldridge. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, like I was saying before, get early access to videos and access to exclusive live streams and all that cool fun stuff, just hit the join button right down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, uh, you can maybe check this video out. Google thinks you like that one uh, or any of the others on the side over here that have my face on them. Go take a look. If you enjoy them and you're not subscribed, I invite you to subscribe. I come back up videos every Monday. All right, cool. That's it for now. You guys go out there and have an eye opening rest of the week. Stay safe. And I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.